welcome back to Scholastically Natalie. If you are interested in writing books and D&D, this is definitely the channel for you, so feel free to hit that subscribe. If you enjoy this talk about a vindication of the rights of women, feel free to let me know with a like or a comment. So, we're continuing with a vindication of the rights of women, which I now realize I have typed incorrectly into this PowerPoint, but I really don't feel like fixing that, to be honest, and I've been waiting to do this piece for when I'm not really tired at midnight. Hi, sorry, I have a pretty bad sleeping schedule. So, we already did just in the general introduction, um, and now we're going to be getting into some of the actual writing. It is only about five pages. Um, it will be relatively long, of course, because it's really academic old language, so I probably will want to stop and explain a lot because it makes my heart happy. Today I am burning a candle as I record this. It's called Pink Sands by Yankee Candle. It's very tasty smelling. Um, I've currently had two sips of Mike's Hard Lemonade and I have a bottle of water uh, on standby for when I get thirsty because I've been coughing a lot today which means my throat is dry. So. What we're doing right now is we're looking at the letter that was to the late M. Talleyrand Paragord, late Bishop of Autumn. Um, she is replying to a pamphlet that he wrote on national education to argue as to why women should be allowed access to good education, essentially. So, we are starting on page 9, and let's get this baby started. She writes, Sir, Having read with great pleasure a pamphlet which you have lately published on national education, I dedicate this volume to you, the first dedication that I have ever written, to induce you to read it with attention, and because I think that you will understand me, which I do not suppose many pert witlings will, who may ridicule the arguments they are unable to answer. So I wanted to pause here and look at the who may riddle the arguments they are unable to answer, because that is something that is so similar to what people do nowadays with political opponents or debate opponents, instead of countering a point or maybe saying, oh, I'm not sure, I'll get back to you on that, people instead turn straight to mocking the other person, undermining their integrity, undermining their, like, personal feelings, rather than actually proving their opinion to be right. I would much prefer to have two people arguing with facts than to have two people standing there calling each other stupid. <laughs> All you're doing with the latter is telling me that both of you kind of suck as people. Okay. But sir, I carry my respect for your understanding still farther, so far that I am confident you will not throw my work aside and hastily conclude that I am in the wrong because you did not view the subject in the same light yourself. And so to add on to saying, hey, please don't make fun of me because you don't have a good counterargument, now she's even saying, I believe that you will take what I'm about to tell you seriously. I'm going to appeal to like your integrity and your professionalism to have you show that you yourself are somebody with honor and that you can have an open mind and listen to other points that you don't agree with. So rather than, you know, ignoring this different news channel that says things that she do that he doesn't agree with, she's asking him to listen to their points at the very least. And pardon my frankness, but I must observe that you treated it in too cursory a manner, contented to consider it as it had been considered formerly, when the rights of man, not too advert to woman, were trampled on as chimerical. So what we're looking on here is a kind of like traditional versus new, um, where she's saying, hey, you guys ignored the woman part of this, and you should be looking at it again. Because when men didn't have the same rights, you were all upset, and you were jumping on that. But now that it comes to woman, you're ignoring it again. I call upon you, therefore, now to weigh what I have advanced respecting the rights of woman and national education, and I call with the firm tone of humanity. For my arguments, sir, are dictated by a disinterested spirit. I plead for my sex, not for myself. Independence I have long considered as the grand blessing of life, the basis of every virtue, and independence I will ever secure by contracting my wants, though I were to live on a barren heath. So what she's saying here is, hey... I don't want this 
just for me. Like, I'm not saying, oh, you should only let, like, white upper middle class ladies go to school. You should let all of us go to school. Um, and so by her invoking the firm tone of humanity, she's saying, hey, all of us are people and all of us deserve to have the same opportunities and to have the same education to make our own choices and be independent. Okay, so now we're moving on. It is then an affection for the whole human race that makes my pen dart rapidly along to support what I believe to be the cause of virtue, and the same motive leads me earnestly to wish to see woman placed in a station in which she would advance instead of retarding. So she's saying that the current place of woman in society is causing stagnation and even degradation, in which she's kind of just accepting her place and never becoming better. The progress of those glorious principles that give a substance to morality. So she's saying, hey, women kind of need an opportunity to get out there and prove that they hold virtues the same as men do. My opinion indeed respecting the rights and duties of women seems to flow so naturally from these same principles that I think it's scarcely possible but that some of the enlarged minds who formed your admirable constitution will coincide with me. In France, there is undoubtedly a more general diffusion of knowledge than in any part of the European world, and I attribute it, in a great measure, to the social intercourse which has long subsisted between the sexes. It is true, I utter my sentiments with freedom, that in France the very essence of sensuality has been extracted to regale the voluptuary, and a kind of sentimental lust has prevailed, which, together with the system of duplicity that the whole tenor of their political and civil, civil government taught, have given a sinner sort of sagacity to the French character, properly termed finesse, and a polish of manners that injures the substance by hunting sincerity out of society. And, modesty, the fairest garb of virtue, has been more grossly insulted in France than even in England, till their women have treated as prudish that attention to decency which brutes instinctively observe. This is a very long paragraph. Um, she's basically giving France a very large backhanded compliment. She's saying, hey, France seems to, France seems to be a bit more advanced than England. Um, but, I mean, they're also all sneaky backstabbers and don't dress modestly. <laughs> Manners and morals are so nearly allied that they have often been confounded, but though the former should only be the natural reflection of the latter, yet when various causes have produced facetious and corrupt manners which are very early caught, morality becomes an empty name. The personal reserve and sacred respect for cleanliness and delicacy in domestic life, which French women almost despise, are the graceful pillars of modesty, but, far from despising them, if the pure flame of patriotism have reached their bosoms, they should labor to improve the morals of their fellow citizens, by teaching men not only to respect modesty in women, but to acquire it themselves, as the only way to merit their esteem. So, basically she's saying, hey, manners and morals generally should be about the same thing, but morality becomes kind of not real when morals are used, not morals, when manners are used like in kind of a corrupt way. Um, and then she's also saying that French women don't like cleanliness or delicacy in their domestic life, um, and therefore they aren't modest. Um, but if they were patriotic, they would be working to improve the morals of their citizens. And at the end of her paragraph, what she's saying there is that men should be modest alongside women because that way the women will, you know, be attracted to them and actually respect them. Okay. Contending for the rights of women, my main argument is built on this simple principle, that, that if she be not prepared by education to become the companion of man, she will stop the progress of knowledge, for truth must be common to all or it will be inefficacious with respect to its influence on general populace. So, what she's saying there is that women not being equal companions to men makes them halt society's progress in general, because they won't be able to support their men or like fully comprehend the society that they're in. And how can woman be expected to cooperate unless she knows why she ought to be virtuous? Unless freedom strengthen her reason till she comprehend her duty and see in what manner it is connected with her real good. 
If children are to be educated to understand the true principle of patriotism, their mother must be a patriot, and the love of mankind from which an orderly train of virtue spring can only be produced by considering the moral and civil interest of mankind, but the education and situation of women at present shuts her out from such investigations. Again, long and conc complicated, but basically what she's saying is that women can't educate their children or support their husbands without being educated themselves. She's saying that, you know, if you want kids to grow up loving and respecting their country, their mother has to love and respect her country, and she can't do that if she doesn't understand the country that she's in. Like, if she's only taught certain things. In this work, I have produced many arguments which to me were conclusive to prove that the prevailing notion respecting a sexual character was subversive of morality, and I have contended that to render the human body and mind... Sorry, I'm trying to figure out what this quote is. I don't think I've said it yet. <laughs> no, wait, I might have. No, I don't think I have yet. And that I have contended, to render the human body and mind more perfect, chastity must more universally prevail, and that chastity will never be respected in the male world till the person of a woman is not, as it were, idolized when little virtue or sense embellish it with the grand traces of mental beauty or the interesting simplicity of affection. So she's saying that seeing someone as a sex object undermines your morality and theirs in the first part she's saying hey if you're looking at somebody and going hey yeah that's like sexy or like ooh, i like that she's been with a lot of men or like ooh, i like that she hasn't been with a lot of men and same with women is saying that like it's showing that it's undermining your mor morals okay and so then she's saying that men can't see chastity as good until women aren't idolized for sex and are instead respected for intelligence or you know given love that's what she means by embellish it with the grand traces of mental beauty or the interesting simplicity of affection what she's arguing is that like at the moment men were seeing women just as sex objects or like as people to make a house for them rather than being somebody with mental weight or somebody that they love So then she's saying, Consider, sir, dispassionately, these observations, for a glimpse of this truth seemed to open before you when you observed, that to see one half of the human race excluded by the other from all participation of government was a political phenomenon that, according to abstract principles, it was impossible to explain. If so, on what does your constitution rest? If the abstract rights of man will bear discussion and explanation, those of women, by a parity of reasoning, will not shrink from the same test though a different opinion prevails in this country built on the very arguments which you use to justify the oppression of women prescription so she's saying that these people have essentially already unwittingly spoken this truth um, when they were trying to apply it to themselves um, and they didn't realize that it could also be applied to the women in their lives um, and then she's saying, and by that she means that if men's rights need to be discussed, then so do women's, of course. But differing opinions are there based on old arguments that they use to justify oppression. Um, and this analysis or that talk of women's rights is not happening because, you know, it's tradition to just ignore it. Consider, I address you as a legislator, whether when men contend for their freedom and to be allowed to judge for themselves respecting their own happiness, it be not inconsistent and unjust to subjugate women, even though you firmly believe that you are acting in the manner best calculated to promote their happiness. Who made man the exclusive judge if women partake with him the gift of reason? So she's saying, if women can reason and think, then why can't they not decide for themselves what makes them happy or contend for their own freedom and why is man the exclusive like person who should know what she wants and she's saying like you know if women weren't supposed to be equals to men then why do they have brains and can think and can reason
whoopsies, I forgot to flip the page. <laughs> okay. In this style argue tyrants of every denomination, from the weak king to the weak father of a family. They are all eager to crush reason, yet always assert that they usurp its throne only to be useful. Do you not act a similar part when you force all women, by denying them civil and political rights, to remain immured and their families groping in the dark? So she's saying, if you can't... Hold on. We haven't gotten to the big part. <laughs> For surely, sir, you will not assert that a duty can be binding which is not founded on reason. So she's saying, um, in what world... If you can't reason with somebody why they should do something, why on earth it would be a binding duty? So, you know, when, you know, you're a small child and your parents are like, oh, go clean your room. And you're like, why? And they're like, because I said so. Like, you're not old enough to be like, hmm, that seems like an unfair argument. Or like, hey, that doesn't seem like a good reason that's going to make me continue to clean my room, right? Like, you have to be pushed into it. But if, say, they were like, oh, well... If you keep your room clean, then you'll be able to get in your out of your room easier, and then you'll be more organized, you'll know where everything is, you'll stop losing all those socks. Then you might want to start to build that habit of doing it yourself, right? So again, if somebody's just like, hey, get on all fours and like wash this sidewalk with a toothbrush, you're gonna be like, why on earth would I do that when there's something to do it better? So if the women are then educated and are like, hey, we don't need to do this thing, then clearly you don't have a good enough reason for them to do it. If indeed this be their destination, arguments may be drawn from reason and thus augustly supported. The more understanding women acquire, the more they will be attached to their duty, comprehending it, for unless they comprehend it, unless their morals be fixed on the same immutable principles as those of man, no authority can make them discharge it in a virtuous manner. They may be convenient slaves, but slavery will have its constant effect, degrading the master and the abject dependent. So basically, logical women should understand their duty and be dedicated to it through proper reasoning. Um, and so then she's also arguing that, hey, if women understand why they need to do this, this, and this, then they'll actually want to do it. They'll be attached to it. And then they will be more than willing to do it once they have the same morals as men. And then they get to make that choice by themselves rather than being uneducated people who are dependent and become slaves to the men around them. It's all about having a choice. But if women are to be excluded without having a voice from a participation of the natural rights of mankind, prove first to ward off the charge of injustice and inconsistency that they want reason. Else this flaw in your new constitution, the first constitution founded on reason, will ever show that man must, in some shape, act like a tyrant. And tyranny, in whatever part of society it rears its brazen front, will ever undermine morality. So what we're saying here is that you have to give people a choice. You have to give them reasons and logic and understanding. You have to educate them. Because peop because these people are made to think and to reason and to know. So, unless you want to be looked at as an unjust, somebody who fosters injustice and inconsistency and will be looked at as a hypocrite, you have to offer people that choice. Or else you yourself are shown to be an immoral person for having taken that tyranny which was forced on you to then free those like you and then force it upon someone else. I have repeatedly asserted and produced what appeared to me irrefragable arguments drawn from matters of fact to prove my assertion that women cannot by force be confined to domestic concerns, for they will, however ignorant, intermeddle with more weighty affairs, neglecting private duties only to disturb, by cunning tricks, the orderly plans of reason which rise above their comprehension. This made me laugh when I read this because she is so sarcastic in that last sentence. Um, basically, she's saying that if you keep people captive, 
they will conspire with each other within themselves to just screw things up for you. Like, it might not be a groundbreaking screw up, but if you keep people under lock and key, if you keep them subjugated, they will figure out some way to get back at you. If a woman is unhappy in her marriage, maybe she's gonna make terrible food for you. Maybe she's gonna slowly poison you. Maybe she's gonna, like, rip up all your documents or make sure that you don't dress well, right? So it's things that wouldn't 100% ruin your life, but they would make it harder. Besides, whilst they are only made to acquire personal accomplishments, men will seek for pleasure in variety, and faithless husbands will make faithless wives. Such ignorant beings, indeed, will be very excusable when, ta not taught to respect public good nor allowed any civil rights, they attempt to do themselves justice by retaliation. So, then they're saying, hey, men are going to cheat on their wives if they don't love them. And then the wives will become faithless as well and cheat on their husbands. And because they are uneducated and silly and not knowledgeable about morals because they've never been to school and observer taught them anything, no one can really be mad at them if they cheat on their husband. Right? Because they don't know any better. So. The box of mischief thus opened in society, what is to preserve? preserve private virtue, the only security of public freedom and universal happiness. Let there be then no coercion established in society. In the common law of gravity prevailing, the sexes will fall into their proper places. And now that more equitable laws are forming your citizens, marriage may become more sacred. Your young men may choose wives from motives of affection, and your maidens allow love to root out vanity. So she's saying that by giving women rights, men won't be able to do, you know, like, whatever they want with, like, their wives or their mistresses, and they'll have to find somebody that they genuinely love. And they're also saying that, hey, instead of women, like, preening and primping and trying to get married to the, get, like, the best marriage, they might actually look for somebody they actually like. The father of a family will not then weaken his constitution and debase his sentiments by visiting the harlot, nor forget in obeying the call of appetite the purpose for which it was implanted, and the mother will not neglect her children to practice the arts of coquetry, when sense and modesty secure her the friendship of her husband. All in all, she's saying that, you know, there will be a better family if you educate all parties involved. But, till men become attentive to the duty of a father, it is vain to expect women to spend that time in their nursery, which they, wise in their generation, choose to spend at their glass. For this exertion of cunning is only an instinct of nature to enable them to obtain indirectly a little of that power of which they are unjustly denied a share. For, if women are not permitted to enjoy legitimate rights, they will render both men and themselves vicious to obtain illicit privileges. So, what she's saying here is that currently, with women uneducated and men believing they're superior, they both will neglect their proper duties. And then she's saying that, you know, if women, women will neglect their children because they want the power that they're being withheld from. Um, and then, so if they can't enjoy rights, they'll make sure that both them and their husband are going to suffer. They're going to seize the rights however they can. I wish, sir, to set some investigations of this kind afloat in France, and should they lead to a confirmation of my principles, when your constitution is revised, the rights of woman may be as respected, if it be fully proven that reason calls for this respect, and loudly demands justice for one half of the human race. I am, sir, yours respectfully, M. W. So, in conclusion... Mary Wollstonecraft is a sassy lady, um, but also she has very well presented an argument which definitely at that time men would not have expected out of a woman. She expresses herself without excess emotion. She's pretty dispassionate, honestly. She writes- she uses strong language, but she definitely- she's not sharing her experience, she's not sharing her feelings, she's appealing solely to logic because if she used pathos or emotions, then the men would call her hysterical. 
So I think she won. That letter was whew, really good. Um, and it was definitely very interesting to read because essentially it's like, it's kind of like a preface for her longer piece of A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, um, which I see I have spelled properly on this last slide. <laughs> But I hope you enjoyed the reading and the mild explanation. I'm sorry for the couple seconds of silence where I lost, lost my place in the slides. I got too excited to talk to you about books again because I haven't talked about books in a while. So I apologize for that one. <laughs> um, next up, we're going to be starting on the actual book, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. Um, that was just a letter that kind of like inspired her to actually write the book. Um, and we will start with chapter one. Let me look at the amount of pages it is. Because depending on how long it is, it might get divided because believe it or not. Oh no, we have the author's introduction first. Which is longer than the last one. But it's only like six pages. Yeah, six pages. Um, so hopefully you will be back for that. Um, if you enjoyed this video, feel free to give me, to leave a like, to subscribe. Um, if you have any interesting comments about this, feel free to leave them. Um, I'm gonna be honest, when I'm reading authors' works, I don't tend to like look them up much. I, I don't really research them a ton because I personally just enjoy reading books. Um, but I guess I can start looking into them a bit more if anybody is interested in that. I guess I, we can take it as kind of like a background info for our next book. <laughs> um, anyways, I hope that this was mildly interesting. I've already said this, haven't I? I'm so bad at signing off, guys. Anyways, feel free to leave a suggestion for the next book you want me to do. I do have a book review. I finished listening to the Marie Kondo audiobook, so I'll try to get that out for next week. Anyways, thank you. I hope you enjoyed listening to this video. Scholastically Natalie, out.